Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is Romans Education Part 1, and this is Session 65. And the reason I'm calling this Part 1 is because this is the first of the four godly decision-making skills that we're going to be uh, educated in and taught. And so when we get through with this first part of wisdom, we move into justice. That will be the Romans Education Part 2, and, and on through the book of Romans. Now, look, I want to just talk to you for a moment about something that I'm really coming to understand better, and I want, you to, I want you to understand it the way I do, because what we're about to do today is go through the book of Romans a little differently than the way we have done it before. I debated about whether or not to do this on the DVD. Um, but because there are so many people that are following along with us, I thought they deserved a kind of explanation too. Thank you, Mark. When, when we're in the book of Romans, we understand what's happening. This is establishment doctrine. And the way I've been treating the book of Romans is... Well, let me back up. Let me say it a different way. In, in our establishment doctrine, we not only have the book of Romans, but we have 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and we have the book of Galatians. And folks, all of those books together... All of those books together, those are going to lay the foundation to get us established and established. Those two words, they both occur in Romans. Establish is to get you going. In other words, to, to get that foundational doctrine laid. By the end of the book of Romans, Paul is talking about to establish you. And that is to stabilize you. In other words, by the, a foundation has been laid, and now you need to be stabilized on that foundation. There's, there's a little bit of difference there. Now, I, I, because of all the things that I've said to you coming along and I'm trying to make this explanation brief, it's going to take all four of those epistles to get us established. And what I'm really understanding Romans to be, gosh, I hate the taste of crow, um, what, I really, what I really am coming to understand Romans to be is, it. well, again, I, I say it this way, Romans does establish us right off the bat in those first five chapters. We got established in our justification. And you got all the detail about that. There's not another epistle that Paul writes that comes close to explaining your justified status. In Romans 6 through 8, he did give us the details of our sanctification. There's not another book that comes close to the detail that's in the book of Romans. And then, in 9, 10, and 11, we got the dispensational change. There is nowhere else where Paul takes three chapters to talk about that issue so that we don't have to go back to the book of Acts to get it, but he explains it from the standpoint of who we are. That was explained <coughs> to Israel back in the book of Acts, but it was explained from their point of view. Now, Paul is explaining it to members of the body of Christ. It takes three chapters to do it. Then when we get into Romans chapter 12, when we get into Romans chapter 12, we do know that this education is going to be broken into those four parts. I know this is old hat for you, but I want to make a point about this. This wisdom, which we know is going to run through verse 16 in this chapter, and by the way, we're going to finish up godly wisdom today. And that's part of the new approach that we're going to take to the book of Romans. But I want to tell you why. We'll be in justice next Sunday. When we finish that up, 
we're going to be in judgment. And when we finish that up, we'll be in equity. And then there is a, uh, uh, there's a piece of information. This actually ends in chapter 15 and verse 7. But we know that Romans runs through chapter 16. So the remainder of chapter 15 and chapter 16 also have to come, have to come after these. So what we're going to wind up with is really this Romans education is going to be in five parts. And so that, that's, not, that's not the part that I'm trying to get to. <clears throat> I guess the way to, for what I'm trying to get at is this. I've been talking to you over and over again about, you know, you're coming through Romans and you're working your way through and you really don't, you know, jump ahead uh, to other things. But how many times have I taken us into Corinthians? A lot. That, and that bothered me. Because as we were looking at Romans, for instance, let me just, I, I really want you to understand this. So just turn, there's no PowerPoint for this. So turn to Romans and look in chapter 12. And if you look in chapter 12, look with me in verse, uh, verse 4. Because you know the first two verses, they are that checkpoint for, uh, 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 for our bodies being a living sacrifice. In verse 3, he talks about that selflessness, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. In verse 4, here's what he says, For we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. That's talking about your physical body. Your physical body has many members. They don't all do the same thing. They don't have the same office. Then in verse 5, he makes the, the analogy. So we, now he's talking about an assembly. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. And you remember it was in those two verses that we talked about those four body attributes. But to teach you those body attributes, I don't know if you recall it, but I took you over to the book of 1 Corinthians and we went through chapter 12 over there and we walked through that, that longer... This is two verses. We walked through a longer passage and we could check off each one of those body attributes in that long piece of information in Corinthians. Let me tell you what bothered me about this all along. Is that... Just looking at verses 4 and 5, I don't know. I kept looking at that and thinking, shouldn't I be able to come up with that just out of Romans? Why did I have to go to Corinthians? And to be honest, I tell you what I thought. I thought because I'm not a fully educated son, I'm just too dumb to get it out of Romans. And I'm used to being too dumb, but it bothered me that I couldn't pull that out of Romans. And I kept looking at those verses. And the truth is, if you're looking at verses 4 and 5, even if you're thinking about body attributes, how do you know there's four? In fact... When I started seeing them in Corinthians, I stopped, I made my own list. I, I think I showed it to you. I think I came up with like seven different ones. But when we went through the text, there was actually four. And everything kind of umbrellaed under those four. Do you, I, I hope you're following where I'm going with this because I felt really guilty about going over to 1 Corinthians when I thought I should have been able to pull all of that out of Romans. And now we're down in verse, we just finished up verse 12. And starting in verse 9, we had this series of exhortations. Let love be without dissimulation. That's how it started out. We worked our way down, we got to verse 12, which was rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. In just a few minutes, we're going to start verse 13. Distributing to the necessity of saints, uh, given to hospitality. 
and we're going to move on down through the rest of the verses. These are, these are short, I want to say staccato. They're just almost one after the other exhortations. And you know what's, what's not in there? Is a bunch of detail. But the wording is precise. The wording is very precise. Let me show you one other thing. If you're looking in Romans 12, look in verse 6. He starts talking about those gifts. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us. And he talks about prophecy, or in verse 7, ministry, or teaching, and verse 8, exhortation, and giving. And, and, and we talked about, remember, I took you back over to 1 Corinthians, and I showed you how Paul talked about those supernatural gifts which were in operation at the beginning of the dispensation of grace were to provide for the edification of the saints until the more excellent way came along. And what was that more excellent way? It was the completion of the, the Scripture. Because those gifts only allowed them to know in part. And that's why he said, when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away. Those two are put as opposed to each other. If, if perfect doesn't mean sinless, it's opposed to in part. So if something is in part, when that, when, when that is perf then, then, then you get the full knowledge. See, when that which is perfect has come. And that was the revelation of Scripture. But look, I'm looking at Romans chapter 12, verses 6, 7, and 8, and I'm thinking, if Paul never wrote 1 Corinthians, how would I even know about that? I couldn't pull it out of Romans 12. And yet Romans 12 is the first thing that we're faced with as we come through. Are you with me so far? So do you see the dilemma I was constantly facing and saying, I should be able to pull all of this out of Romans 12. And I kind of felt like a dumbbell because I couldn't do that. And I kept taking you over to Corinthians. And even on the tape, I even apologized sometimes for taking you over ahead, but I wanted you to see it. But because of all of that, I have come to understand something. The light kind of came on for me. Even a blind hog can find an acorn. And I found my acorn during the break. You're going to be glad because it's going to change the way we go through Romans. But do you know what I see Romans as now? Because these are in this order, what I see happening in Romans is, yes, I, I want to be clear about this. In those first chapters, from chapters, from chapters 1 through 11... We get detailed doctrine about our justification, sanctification, and the dispensational change. We got that. But when you get, but when you get to chapter 12, from chapter 12 to chapter 16, what you, I believe that we're really looking at in Romans is an outline of everything that is contained in the education. And by the way, aren't like, if, you've, if you ever went to college or even in high school, some of your teachers or professors even taught this way. They stood up at the beginning of the course and they said, here are the things we're going to cover. And they talked about them. That was kind of the outline for where the whole thing was going. And then what did they do? They came back and they started doing the detailed work of each one of those things working through. And I think that's why I couldn't find all those details in Romans because we were never meant to just look at Romans and now you know everything you need to know. You're going to have to have, if I'm right about this, and this is the outline then you know what these two are doing? They're providing the detail that fill in what we already have been introduced to in Romans. 
And by the way, this is really a pretty, I think, a pretty wise way to do it. Because in Romans, you're being introduced to some concepts so that you know some things about them. But when we get to the details over here, once you've got that, you know, kind of under your belt, so to speak, then when he starts to build on that, it all kind of makes sense. So, here's what I've done up till now because I kept thinking, we've got to be, I've got to be able to pull all this out of Romans. So, to what did we do? I treated every verse in Romans like it was the, the place to teach all the details. So, you know what we did? We spent a long time on every verse. So, this is why... This is why are, do you at least understand what I'm saying about this? Now, I, look, I didn't want to bring this up, but let me give you... Let me, let me just give you one more, because these things haunted me. I know when I show up here and I'm teaching this, you know, I want to make sure it's right, you know, and I've really gone over it. But here's the thing. I'm always looking at things in my study that are bugging me because, like this thing about not getting all the detail out of Roman. Do you remember Romans 8, 14 and 15 where you were told that you were a son and you'd been given the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And do you remember what I said to you back then? I said the cry of Abba, Father has to be more than just this emotional thing about, oh boy, I'm a son. But you have to make that cry intelligently. In other words, you have to know what you're saying yes to. God's not just asking it. I have to tell you, that I, I, this is a perfect illustration because I did this to Billy before the service. Bob, Bob told me, you know, if you were my friend, you would have helped me out last week. And I said, really? What went on last week? And he described a procedure that he went through that I am not willing to say publicly on the tape. And I said, and you think I was going to help you how? He said, you would have done it for me in my place. And I said, and that's why you don't have any friends. Because none of us are going to do that. I said, when you got married to Norma, that became her responsibility, right? Right? And so I said, Billy would do it for me. And so I asked, I said, would it, would it you, honey? And she went, do what? <laughs> you know what she was doing? She was asking, what am I saying yes to? And your father doesn't do that to you. He's not asking you to say yes. And, 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 and after you say yes, I'll fill you in. He's asking you to say yes, and you go in with your eyes open, right? Right? All right, so if Romans 8, and chapter 8, verses 14 and 15 now tell you that you're a son by way of adoption, how in the world can you really say yes to that? Because at that point, fully, unless I took you ahead, because the first time you find out that you're going to go through suffering and you're supposed to give your body a, as a living sacrifice. This just, when's the first time you're told anything about suffering? It's not until, look, you're in, you're in your Bible, look back in Romans 8. In Romans 8, 14 and 15, there's the cry of Abba, Father. And that's not until verse 17 that you get that join heir, if so be that we suffer with him. So if I was just coming down through the verses and got you to 14 and 15, you haven't even been told yet about suffering with Him. How could you make that? You, you, you see, if I'm, if I'm not supposed to know what's over there, how could you make that intelligent cry? But if, but if I'm right and Romans is the out... And by the way, I'm not saying people in this room haven't made the cry of Abba Father. You have. But you have because... I took you somewhere else. And sh in fact, on those two verses, we spent 122 lessons on verses 14 and 15. So you learned a bunch of stuff. Not all of it was behind Romans 8, 
Some of it was ahead of Romans 8. And because you knew that, you were able to make that cry of Abba Father. But you see, that's my point. If you were only coming through the book of Romans and you never went ahead, the only thing you would know is the professor would stand up knowing this verse was in there. The professor would stand up giving his outline of the whole course and he would say, and at some point during this course, you're going to have the opportunity to say yes to a very special opportunity being offered to you by your father. That's what would be in the outline, right? Because in verses 14 and 15 alone, you're not given all of that. And Paul hasn't even talked about it up to this point. Okay, I spent too long on this, but one last one. The tutor and governor issue. We talked about how we have liberty. Do you, do you know the first place that Paul talks about tutors and governors? Yeah. It's in the book of Galatians. If we didn't go over there and not... <laughs> Audie's kind of shining this now. Okay. If you didn't go to Galatians, you wouldn't even know the concept by that term. And I, I don't know if you recall, but when I was, we were in orientation, sonship orientation, I took you to Galatians and I showed you that passage. How a child is under tutors and governors until the time appointed by the Father. So... What I'm saying to you is, it has become abundantly clear to me two things. Number one, I can't know all of the detail by just going through the book of Romans alone. Number two, we need 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Galatians to be able to fill in all of the details of the things that we're going to have to know to get ourselves established. This is good news, and, 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 and in a way it's not really bad news, but it's good news because you realize that means through Romans, I have to start treating it what it is, like an outline. And instead of trying to teach every single detail out of Romans, I'm just supposed to give you what's in the outline, and then when we get to Corinthians, we start looking at the details. So that means we're going to get to go through Romans a lot quicker which is why we're going to do something we've never done before. Even though I'm taking this time now, we're going to do Romans uh, at 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 today. I know. I know. You'll probably have withdrawals, and you'll need some time to recover. But we're, and this is the way we're go I'm going to do it. The way, when, when Romans does detail, we'll do the detail. But if it's not then I'm going to teach it for what it is on the page in Romans and we'll trust the curriculum to give us the details when we come to it. Now there's other things about this. I don't know if you know much about the order of the books that Paul wrote them in, but the first book that Paul wrote out of all 13 epistles was the book of 1 Corinthians. There's a couple of years there where all, people differ about, was it 56 A.D. or 58 A.D.? I mean, there's a little bit of, you know, uh, there's a couple of years there that you can't quite pin it down. But that was the first book that was written. And when he wrote that book to the Corinthians, do you know, there were, remember the supernatural gifts of apostles and prophets, they identified that book as inspired scripture, and then you know what they did? They made a multiplicity of copies and they distributed those copies as the word of God out to other churches. And he writes 1 Corinthians and even Galatians before he writes the book of Romans. So if you're at Rome and you're getting this epistle, when Paul says the things that he does, they've probably already seen 1 Corinthians. You, you see? And if they did, then as they're going through this epistle in Romans, they would be going, oh yeah, oh yeah, I, I, I see, yeah. Do, do you, you see? And so for them, 
Romans wasn't, it didn't really serve as the outline. You know what it served? It served as the summary. In other words, all that detailed doctrine you guys have already been looking at for years. So you know what Romans is? It is very compact and precise. Uh, all the doctrine is packed in to these chapters because when you get to the education, you're really just talking about 12 to 16. You're talking about five chapters. That's all you're talking. And so that means everything that you're going to get in detail in First and Second Corinthians and Galatians is kind of compacted down into five chapters in Romans. And so for us, it's the first book. It serves as the outline for what's coming. Do you see? Do you at least understand why I'm thinking about it the way I am? You're all kind of looking at me like, I don't know what he's doing. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm just explaining why. Because all of a sudden, you know, we've been driving a bus, and now we're about to climb in a jet. And I just didn't want you to have shock. Okay. That being said, let me give you now, and this is the way I probably should have done this in the beginning, is I'm going, to, I'm going to look back in verse 9, and I'm going to give you the components. These are the component parts of what's been given to us without going anywhere else to try to bring all that information in. Here we go. So Romans chapter 12, verse 9, when it says, Let love be without dissimulation. You know what dissimulation is. It means if the root is dissimilar. In other words, don't let your love be dissimilar from who you are. In other words, let your love be as it should be in a son or daughter, without dissimulation. In other words, let it be in accordance with who you really are. And that fidelity, that is the first component and, 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 uh, of what you're being taught here. Now, remember, we've already got another one. Remember back up in the chapter... Uh, for a man to not think of himself more highly, but uh, that was selflessness, remember? Now we've got fidelity, or fidelity is faithfulness. Back when I was a kid, you had records that were called high fidelity. And, and that meant they were m more faithful to the original recording. And so, this, and, and I'm using that because it, with, being without dissimulation means that you're being true to who you are and how you love the other members of the assembly. Okay. And by the way, um, we're going to, that issue of letting, having your love not be dissimilar from who you are and what it's supposed to be is a huge, huge issue. If I had, wasn't approaching this the way that I was before, you know what I'd be doing right now? I'd be taking us to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and I'd be talking to you about and though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am what? Nothing. And though I have all faith so I could remove mountains and all that bit and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. And Paul is going to go, but we'll get to that when we get to Corinthians. Right now, here's what you're being introduced to. You're being introduced to the fact that your, your love is supposed to be in perfect accordance with who you are and, and our love for each other. And this is a big issue to God, and this is never, never going to go away. Even in the advanced epistles, Paul starts out those epistles making a reference to this issue. This is a huge issue. And how unfair is it for me, because we read about it in a single verse in Romans, to think that that love has been fully generated in all of us. See, we've got to go through the doctrine to be able to get that. Okay, so there's the first one. Here's the second one in verse 9, the last half. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. And that means, and, and, and that component is that of discernment. That we're supposed to be so attached and... Uh, cleave to that which is good. So attached 
to this sonship education and to the members of this assembly and our desire to see every member of this assembly get this, that, we, that, that actually dictates what we hate. And so we discern those things which are either beneficial to this assembly or harmful to this assembly. Here's the next one. Verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. I did give you this one. It was loving kindness. So I don't need to say a whole lot about that. Just to remind you that the kindly affection, that root word was K-I-N, kin, is the kind of affection that you have for family. And so we're supposed to love each other and begin looking at each other as family. And although this assembly has made great strides toward that, and I will say that, I've seen this, we're going to make more. And this truly is, we truly are going to be knit together in that. The next one is in verse 10, the last part of the verse, in honor preferring one another. And that means that we, that means that we value and esteem the other members here. And, what we're, and because it says prefer one another, we went through that word. We're interested in advancing the other members of this assembly, in seeing their increase, seeing them be successful sons and daughters. That we, that's the kind of thing that we expect as the doctrine is going to be producing in us. And again, even though we've covered a lot about this, and I've seen some things about it, we have more, more things to do with that. Verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And I summed all of that up into a single component of enthusiasm. And, that, and not reluctance in performing our reasonable service, but actually being excited about being a part of that and laboring with our Father. So understanding that's really what we're doing. And then in verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. And I sum that up into a single, I could have broken that into parts, but really, when we're meeting, rejoicing in hope, that impl if there's a hope, it implies some trouble that this hope is, is actually something that we're counting on here. And so with all of that, as we're going through those, those, those troubles and tribulations of life, whatever they might be, then we realize that we can be patient in tribulation while we continue instant in prayer. Those are, I, so I summed all of those up into patience. Uh, and, and now we're going to get to verse 13. And I need to cover verse th 13 at least before we stop for this break. So here we go. Verse 13, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. And the first part, this distributing to the necessity of saints, I've summed up under the term benevolent. And, that, and, and because it's the necessity of saints, then we're talking about distributing to the saints the things that are necessary for life. Now, does that mean you can't give something to somebody that's, you know, not starving to death or naked in the cold? Of course not. Of course you can. And we do that. But what this is talking about is actually discerning the circumstances in the life of these other saints and when there's a necessity of their well-being or a necessity for life that's missing, then it becomes our privilege and our responsibility to, to meet those needs in the lives of those saints. And I believe that this is really talking about physical things. But it could be of a different nature. We know that when the policy of evil comes along, that it's not only going to provide for some physical things to be missing for us, but there's also going to be some mental and emotional attacks that are meant to send you into a depression and make you quit. And at that point, distributing to the necessity of saints isn't about giving somebody groceries or clothing or money. Do you know what that's about? That's about coming alongside and and encouraging them and sharing in this thing that they're going through and, and going through them with it. 
and being there for them and, and, and being someone they can lean on during a very difficult time. Um, and, 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 by the, and, and when it's a physical thing, and believe me, the policy of evil, that was a good point I was going to make, by the way, at the beginning, because I've been telling you that when we get to Romans chapter 13, in the middle of that chapter, when we talk about the armor of light, that that's when Satan gets the go-ahead to really turn it on. If this is the outline, he doesn't get to do that just because you turn the page to Romans 13. We have to actually be there in the doctrine. And put, so that's a, good, that's a good thing, right? Because I know if Clifford was here, he was always wondering. So when we get to 13, he gets, to, he, he gets the green light to go after us. Now we understand, you know what, there's other doctrine we've got to get to. But you know what, you're told about it though in Romans 13. You're certainly told about it, although you won't know everything you need to know to put on that armor of light. Just saying. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the last part of verse 13, distributing to the necessity, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I should have done this one. Given to hospitality, the last part of the verse, and, and I just used that word, hospitality. Because, <clears throat> look, here's what the Oxford English Dictionary says. Hospitality is the friendly and generous reception of guests and visitors. Now, I need to get you to the end of this, this thing right here before we break. That's the dictionary definition. When Paul is talking about this, he's not talking about hospitality only in the way the world sees hospitality. And by the way, I, I know that this has been taught before. Some people are saying, oh, given to hospitality, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to just go out into the world and look for people to bring in and, and, and to give hospitality to, and you kind of turn your home into a, a hotel. That's not what he's talking about. <laughs> that, I, 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 don't, I don't believe that at all. I do believe the hospitality that he's talking about means that that generous and friendly reception of those who are guests or visitors. By the way, I, let me just back up and show you this verse because I do need to say this. Distributing to the necessity of saints, that's about other believers, right? We're looking, well, we're looking at them right here. When he says, given to hospitality... He's not limiting that to saved or lost. It could be either of those. That you have the opportunity. But let me tell you what this hospitality is about. This is about being hospitable with a purpose behind it. Not just the idea we're having somebody in, oh boy. But that there is a reason for that. Now in the last, oh, year and a half... We've had more opportunity for family and friends to come and visit with us than ever before. And we've enjoyed that. But I can tell you, and I didn't rehearse this with her, but I can tell you that Billy and I have sat down over and over and talked about what we wanted to accomplish when those folks came. We have actually invited folks to our house for the purpose of telling them about sonship. We have invited folks to our house. And I have to tell you, when, when, when folks have visited, we have discussed a lot of doctrine. And a lot of good things have come out of that. And, and you know, when they come, we always, you know, we're always trying to make them feel welcome and, 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 and trying to kind of roll out the carpet for them because... We have, a, we have something that we think is of so great a value that we want to impart to them. And I have seen in my own family those that I told about sonship way back there that looked at me like I had lost it. In fact, they told me that. In fact, I'll tell you, you've, you've, my daughter's been here a couple of times. You've, you, you've seen her. And she said, Dad, when you first came and told us about sonship, I told Jeff, my dad has lost it. He has flipped. I don't know what's going on with him. Because I said to her, look, so much of what I taught you was wrong. 
And that was hard for her because she said, I saw you work at it. I saw you prepare. I saw you study. And now you're telling me all that was wrong? And I said, not all of it. There is a God. <laughs> Just most of the rest of it. <laughs> but she said, that was so hard for me. Do you know when she turned the corner? By sitting at our kitchen table and us talking about these issues. And, then, and she told me, she said, you know, at first when you would talk about things, I understood what you said, but there was this reservation in my head. There was this reservation. And I, I thought, but what about this? Or, you know, what about that? And she said, and then the next time we would talk, I would understand a little better. And she said, and then the last time, that she said that when we, I went up to do my uncle's funeral, who passed away during our break, and, um, and so we rode together. We picked her up up in North Texas, and we rode together. I don't know, how long did we talk about this on, in, on the way back? Most all the way home. Okay, well, that was a four-hour trip, but I would say probably a, a, a two hours of it. She said, uh, she, she was telling me this, and she said, and we were talking about all these issues. She said, but the last time we were down there, you said things and all of those things you had said before made sense. And it all fell into place. And she said, and, I, and now every time we talk about it, I understand more and more, and I start putting some things together myself. This is what I'm talking about. Of course we love to have our family in. Of course. And she's already saved. So, you know what, I know she's going. But I want more than that for those people that come to visit. So there's purpose behind the hospitality. It's not just, we're like the world. You're just showing up and we're just chilling out and that's all we care about. I really do, and I, you know, and I didn't put it in your notes, it's in my notes. I have a whole list of things that I was just going to tell you about, but I've already gone over time. But I have to tell you that these things have always been with some idea of ministering the truth to people who have who have come into our home. And we've invited them with that intent. And when folks have called and said, we want to come and visit, then we have made sure we've devised purpose that is behind that. That's what this hospitality is about. And we can be hospitable corporately as an assembly. So when somebody, God help them, comes in the door... We welcome them and we make them feel welcome because there's a message we want them to hear. And the same thing happens in our homes individually. That when we have those folks in, that we have these kinds of discussions. And we have these kinds of conversations. Because don't we want more than just... Hey, I'm, look, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you can't go do something fun. And, and, you know, and when they come, you know, you can't get out of the schedule and do something. I'm not saying you can't do that. I'm not saying every word has to be about, look, I'm going to read through the book of Romans while y'all are here. So just whatever you're doing, I'm just going to walk around and read out of the book of Romans. I'm not saying that, but I am saying there has to be, there has to be, some, well, for us. And I think that's what Paul is talking about here. He's not saying turn your house into a hotel and just put people up. Because when someone comes into your home that's not saved, you know the thing they need to hear before they leave. And if they are, then there's another message they need to hear before they leave. So what about the couple that just visited us over this break that came out from Arizona? They know about sonship. They know about right division. They, they're saved. You know, they know about all those things. So what do we do? We fellowship around these things. And you know what that becomes? That becomes a time of refreshing. Because there's just not a whole big group of people that you can talk about this to, is there? Without them looking at you like you're nuts? And isn't that refreshing? So all of this serves a purpose. And by the way, we talked to them on the phone about this very purpose, about the reason they were coming out. Okay, it took a long time to say that, but... I wanted to make that clear. The hospitality issue 
<clears throat> is just that. It, it is with that in mind. So when we come back from the break, we'll take it.